Welcome to this new episode of Eagle Rewind. I'm Josh McInerney. I'm Parker Stone. We're going to start this week's episode off by talking about the Green Valley boys basketball team. The boys team finished with the record of 9-13 and and 4-6 and in conference. They actually finished the season with three straight wins as they beat Truman 53-51. That's a big win as Truman has Najee Williams, one of the top players in the area, Max Black, lights out three-point shooter, Max Rooney, and also, I can't remember his name, really good point guard. And then they also beat Belton 53-44 in Odessa. They beat pretty bad 51-36. Yep. And they play this coming Saturday against Lee Summit North in the sectional round, correct? Yes. Um, and then to districts. lead the team, districts, to lead the team, Cole Keller uh, finished the se- season averaging 19.82 points per game, 10 rebounds per game, two assists, and two and a half blocks. That boy averaged a double-double, Russell Westbrook type stats. <laughs> he did. Uh, he absolutely balled out this season. His best season, or best game statistically, was against Fordo Sage, where he scored 29 points and had 22 rebounds. Jeez. Absolutely dominant. Well, Chamberlain type beat. Yep. And Cole led the offense quite a bit. Yeah, you know, it had 436 points on the season, which is pretty good. He's going to have a chance to get more as well. To go along with that, he had 226 rebounds. Wow. Absolute board getter. And then the second leading scorer on the team was the head coach's son, Owen Herbert. Only a sophomore. He averaged nine points a game, which almost all of them were on threes. I mean, he was 52 for 138 on threes with a 37% three-point percentage. So he got that strap on him. Yep. And the Eagles had, I believe, four sophomores on the team. Is that correct? I believe so. They had... Keegan Hart, Alex Snyder, Avery Garman, oh. Pierce Buzlow, and Owen Herbert. So that'd be five. They had five. So, and a lot of them got uh, pretty heavy minutes to, in the varsity game. So the future could be bright for the Eagles as they only have four leaving seniors and not a lot of juniors with varsity experience. So the young guys are really going to take over next year. Of course, it'll really hurt to lose Cole Keller, who was by far the team's leading scorer. So they're going to have to have uh, either one guy or a group of guys step it up to make up for that scoring difference. For sure. Now we're going to talk about the girls' team. Uh, the Lady Eagles finished with a record of 11-6 and six and 4-4 four and four conference. I mean, they're very streaky throughout the season. They had a four-game winning streak and a five-game winning streak. And then to end the season, they actually went 2-2, two and two, lost Will and Christman, very good team, but got beat pretty bad. Then Florida Sage, they absolutely killed. They beat 61-29. Then they lost to William Christman again, this time by only four, though. Good game. And then they beat Truman 56-51. And they actually – so they ended the season 3-2 and because they beat Raytown in an overtime game last night, 61-59, to I believe. Yeah, they had kind of an up-and-down season, and they play this weekend also against Lee Summit North. In the districts. And if they win – and Blue Springs wins, we could possibly see a ma- matchup in the playoffs between Jada Williams and Grace Slaughter, which would be insane. Any normal year, it's a sellout crowd. Yep. Both girls are the two top players in the state of Missouri in their grade, two of the top players in the country, actually, and they played on the same junior NBA team that won the championship this past summer. Um, and Grace, this high school season, she averaged 26 points per game with wow. seven rebounds. And 1.6 assists. Absolute scoring machine. Wow. And she actually, only as a sophomore, she recorded her 1,000th point for the season, which is crazy. Yep. She's on pace to absolutely shatter the Grain Valley record, which is somewhere, it's a, it's right above 1,400, and she's already passed 1,000. Um, and her best uh, scoring game this season was against Raytown, where she dropped 45. And that's where she actually broke the score record for most points scored in a game. 45 points in one game. I, the most I ever scored in a game was 21, and I felt on top of the world. I can't imagine what 45 would be. I mean, like. I dropped 25, so I had, okay. that, I had that strap on me that night. <laughs> I had, not to like brag or nothing, but I was hitting from everywhere. Yep. And Grace, um, much like Cole Keller, she really led the team in scoring and provided for the team in a lot of ways. But the benefit the girls have is Grace is only a sophomore, so she's got two years to, to grow. And... She's only going to gonna get better from here. So who knows? She could average 35 or more points next year in her senior year. Yeah, and think about this, though. We said our highest point, yours was 21 ever in a game, minus 25. Grace is averaging 26 a game. 
Yeah. That, that, yeah, that's insane. <laughs> She's averaging more than our careers. <laughs> yeah. Our careers. And then second leading score on the team was Gabby Kime at six points per game to go along with six rebounds. That's what she was. A, she was the board getter for the team, looks like. Uh, and she she did have some pretty great games where she really burst onto the scene. She to, re- to start the regular season, she had seventeen points, and then had ten points in a game and nine. Uh, that she, that seventeen points game was actually her first game ever as a Green Valley Eagle. She moved in from Wisconsin, so yeah. burst on the scene out of nowhere. And to go along with the success of the basketball teams, Grand Valley really showed up in wrestling this past season as they are sending 10 boy wrestlers to sectionals. Leading the team is Hunter Newsome, and with him, along with him is Gavin Parks, Brock Smith, Drew Ascona, Tanner Barker, Camden Nelson, Evan Reich, Cameron Mickelson, O.T. Frederick, and Donovan McBride. So we'd like to... Uh, congratulate all those guys and wish them best of luck in sectionals and state. Yeah, it's actually impressive, though. There's three seniors, uh, I believe, three juniors, and then five sophomores, and I believe it's two or three freshmen, which, I mean, that's, like, pretty spread out evenly. Yeah. And to add to that, we'd also like to congratulate Sevi, the first ever girls wrestler, and who'd make it, even make it this far at all. I mean, we had one last year, but... Sevy is just blowing everybody out of the water as a freshman, like pinning everybody within a minute. Is which she actually won the championship round last week to move on in twenty eight seconds, which is crazy. So good luck to her. Yep, and also good luck to her next year's football season. She actually does have a shot at becoming a starting offensive lineman for the varsity team next year. That's impressive as a sophomore. So the Eagles are in good hands as far as wrestling goes in the future. Um, and now we're going to move on to Royals baseball, which personally, baseball season is my favorite season. Uh, I do love basketball and football season, but baseball is my absolute favorite. And, you know, I've, I'm always excited about the Royals, but this year just feels different. The Royals are making moves. They're ready to win this year. What? <laughs> All right, you ready? The Royals have proven that they're ready to win this year, and they've made a lot of signings and trades that prove that. So I'm just going to begin with some of the offseason signings that they made. Uh, they signed Carlos Santana to a big contract, and honestly, I was not expecting that at all. Were you? No, I was not. I mean, he is older, but hopefully he can play like his younger self with it. The Indians, he was a stud, had a great bat. Yeah, and he always, it felt like he always dominated the Royals. It just, oh yeah. anytime he stepped against the Royals, it was guaranteed he hit a home run in the game. And Carlos Santana is a huge, huge upgrade compared to what the Royals had at first base because they gave Ryan O'Hearn tons of chances. They gave McBroom chances, and neither one of those guys were able to really deliver and be that... Um, true first baseman that the Royals have been looking for ever since Eric Cosmer left. Yeah, for sure. And first base is actually a, an important position. I mean, you have to have a great bat, and neither of them really, honestly, hit the ball that well. Hopefully. No. Ever, well, O'Hearn, you know, he really burst onto the scene with his yeah. rookie season. Uh, but since then, he's really fallen off, and he hasn't been able to find consistency. Um, and then another signing that kind of went under the radar – and but it was a minor league signing, but not a lot of people are talking about it. it was Hanser Alberto, and I, I just love that guy's name. That's an awesome name. But, yeah, um, he's coming in from the uh, Orioles organization, and Nicky Lopez, who is the Royals' starting second baseman, is Gold Glove caliber. That guy is an absolute stud uh, when it comes to defense, but offensively, in his first two seasons, he has not been able to perform at the big league level. He was able to hit for pretty good average in the minors, but hasn't been able to translate that to the bigs. And Hanser Alberto, um, he has his averages are similar, except against left-handed batters. The guy is bat. He in his career he batted three fifty against left-handed batters, which is absolutely insane. He's so, left-handed batters or pitchers? Excuse me, against left-handed <laughs> I was about pitchers. To say, yeah, yeah. Um, and. Even if he doesn't beat out Nicky Lopez for the starting job, which I don't think he will, he would be a great backup to him. A great backup. Time to um, rest or something? Yeah, a good utility guy. 
And then another signing that the Royals got was Michael A. Taylor in center field. The Royals have, in the outfield, they've been kind of just doing patchwork out there for the past couple years. And I feel like this is a really good signing defensively. You know, we'll see what he does offensively. He's never been a huge batter. And that trade for Benintendi, I mean, if last year he didn't have a great season, but his rookie year he was amazing. And he's still young. His con- I mean, that's a big upgrade, I think. Yep. Uh, Andrew Benatendi, I I always thought the Royals should trade for him, and I after this uh, the off season had gone on for a while, I had given up hope. I was like, they're not getting him. Then I got the news that they traded for him, and I was absolutely ecstatic. He's only twenty six years old, almost twenty seven. He's already won a World Series. He's proven that he can hit at the big league level. And what the Royals gave up for him, I'm absolutely okay with. They oh, gave up too. they gave up Franchi Cordero who is the exact same age as Ben Intendi, but he's still trying to find his uh try, still trying to find himself in the big leagues. He's got a lot of power, but he hasn't been able to put it all together and his average isn't as high as it should be. Uh there's just too many question marks around Franchi Cordero and defensively he's not even close to what Ben Intendi is. Oh no. Hey, ben Intendi in the outfield is just a highlight maker. Yep. Uh that one play that he made against the Astros and the ALCS Insane. that was bases loaded basically saved the game, saved the yeah. World Series. Um, and then another guy they gave up was Cahill Lee. And Cahill Lee is, was ranked the Royals' 10th prospect. He was drafted at a high school by the Royals. Uh, the guy's got a ton of speeds. He, he stole over 50 bases in the minor league season in 2019. He's got some pretty good power, but his strikeout percentage is through the roof. It's over, it's over thirty two percent. Wow. Um, so there's just a lot of there's a lot there's there's a very high ceiling for Cahill Lee, but I feel like a very low floor. And you, I personally, with his strikeout percentage, I don't think he would have performed at the big league level that the Royals had hoped for when they drafted him. Yeah, I'm willing to take the chances with Benintendi over him. Yep, and then some other signings the Royals made was Irvin Santana. They brought him back on the minor league deal. They're giving him a chance to make the team. He's not on the 40-man roster this year. He's not on the 40-man right now, but if he pitches well enough this season, this spring training, he could make the team. And then Wade Davis, they brought back the waiter, which um, I'm absolutely ecstatic about just because that guy has been through it all. You know, he's, he's been down in the trenches when he was with Tampa Bay as a starter. Then he got traded the Royals became one of the most dominant bullpen pitchers of all time in major league baseball over a three year span. His ERA was uh, 1.1. He led the Royals to the world series. And I don't think the Royals win the world series without that HDH combo. Definitely not. So even if he doesn't make the team and he happens to be in the minors or something, that is a he's a great guy to mentor these guys during the spring. And if he makes the team, that's even better. And then they brought back Greg Holland and stuff like that. So I'm gonna make my prediction for the team that's coming the the 26 man roster to start the season. Uh, undoubtedly, the, the starting catcher is Salvador Perez. That guy had his best statistic batting season in 2020 of course it was a shortened season he only played 37 games because of that eye problem but he did win comeback player of the year he batted 333 had 11 home runs and 12 doubles absolutely tore it up and then the the battle in spring training for catcher is the backup spot between cam gallagher and mabry's valoria cam gallagher has is much older he's got more experience and valoria is uh he's still 23 years old He's been up and down hitting, and I still think he's got a lot of room to grow. And But he is out of options, so both him and Gallagher are out of options, so that's a big problem. So the Royals are going to have to choose one of them, possibly trade one, wave one. Uh, I love Valoria, but between for the future... The Royals still have MJ Mendelis and Sebastian Riviera, who are both in the young 20s. Uh, I feel like they have a bit more potential than Valoria. I think Cam, Gall- Cam Gallagher right now is the better ball player, so I think the Royals go with Cam Gallagher. Not really sure what they do with Valoria. Uh, and then go to first base. Carlos Santana is obviously the starting pitcher, or starting first <laughs> yeah, baseman, excuse yeah. me. Um, 
he's got a great glove, outstanding bat. The The real battle here is the battle that's been going on for three years now between O'Hearn and McBroom. Personally, I like McBroom way Me too. more. I was going to say, I think they go to McBroom just because clutchness. Yep. McBroom, he led baseball last year in pinch hit home runs, which he had three. Um, he's got an okay first place glove, but the thing that to me that really sets him apart from O'Hearn is he can play the outfield and he has done it mm-hmm. in games. And I just like him more. He seems like a, a more fun guy. <laughs> yeah. um, I think he's a better batter, but the I think O'Hearn has uh, he has more of a leash because he's a Royals homegrown player. They drafted him out of Sam Houston State. Mike Matheny has said he loves O'Hearn. He's going to give him chances. That's what he said last year. I don't know if he will this year. A lot of people are projecting O'Hearn, but... I see him taking McBroom over him. I hope they do, but the the thing with O'Hearn, he is a left-handed batter, and that make, that if you want to, someone to compliment Carlos Santana, who is a right-handed batter, you would want a left-handed batter, and McBroom is right-handed. So I think because he's lefty, that gives him the benefit and because he grew up in the Royals organization. But I just don't see him being able to put together what he did his rookie season. Uh, if I were the GM, which, you know, Dayton Moore, is, he's paid to be the GM for a reason. He's done a lot of great moves. He'll make the right decision. But if it were me, I think I would go with Mick Broom. Second base right now, it's unquestionably Nicky Lopez. Uh, the guy finished third in AL in second ba- second base Gold Glove voting in the AL last year. Um, I honestly think he can put it together on the bat. He proved in college and in the minor leagues he could hit. Once he starts going to left field to the opposite field like he did when he was uh, down in the minors, I think he'll really pick it up. Um, you know, this is his third season. He's had. Uh, it's still been a learning experience for him, so I think this year he k- kind of puts it together and bats right around a two forty range. Third base, Hunter Dozier's back at third base. You know they've really moved him around. Last year they had to he finished at first base just because of the lack of production from O'Hearn and McBroom, but now he's back where he started at third base, um, and I love it because they had Michael Franco there last year who. I liked, but I'm a huge Hunter Dozier fan. I've always loved that guy. He's very good. He is. He's he's 29 years old, so he's a little bit older. But um, his 2019 numbers were absolutely outstanding. He was he finished second in third base voting for the All Star game. He hit over 20 home runs, but in 2020 he started the season. He had COVID, and that really affected him. So he started the season late. He told everybody that, you know, he never really got his lungs back. He, he was kind of fatigued. So 2020 it was kind of a down year for him. But on the positive, he his walk percentage went up to 14%. So I believe if Dozier can put together that, that batter eye where he can get his walks like he did last year and barrel balls and get hard line drives like he did in 2019, you could be looking at a serious breakout candidate and a possible all-star in Hunter Dozier. Yeah, I agree. Um, and then shortstop, Adalberto Mondesi. I'm going to make a quick prediction here. Okay. I think he has his best season he's had. I think he, towards the end of the season, he started to find it. And Me too. I, I think he has an amazing season. Um, last year, Mondesi started as, for the first, it was a 60-game season, about half, for the first 30 games. He was the worst player in baseball I had ever seen. He was... <laughs> He was swinging at pitches that bounced four feet in front of the plate. He was watching strikes right down the middle. He was making errors. He looked like he had no idea how to play the game. And I give, I tip my hat to Mike Matheny because he left him in there. He didn't, he didn't cave to the pressure of everybody. He Crazy left, season, yep. yep, he left Montesi in there because he believed in his guys, which I absolutely respect. Me too. And Montesi broke through. He finished the season absolutely. Lava hot. He was one of the best players in baseball to finish the season. He hit the farthest home run. He hit the farthest baseball of the Royals last year on his breakout home run. He started stealing bases again. He was making Gold Glove plays, and he got his he got uh, he got his swagger back. You know. Yep. And confidence. if you remember, he finished twenty nineteen on the injured list. He he tore his shoulder up. He had to have surgery. So 
he was still rehabbing from that. And then with the COVID, he, his spring training was taken away from him. So he was out of baseball for almost a year. And I don't think he ever got his confidence back. He, I don't know if – I've never had an injury like that, but I know for some guys they don't trust themselves coming back from injury. So maybe he just didn't have faith in his shoulder and then he started not performing as well and he really got in his head, but then he really broke through. And I feel like he puts it all together and the Adalberto Montesi that the Royals have been waiting for, that the fans have been dying for, I feel like he breaks through the season and he becomes a possible MVP candidate, leads the Royals is the face of the franchise like this is going to be the guy we've been waiting for for years i agree uh, and also to add that i'd like to see bobby Witt get a chance somewhere somewhere in the field oh, well, i got some <laughs> i got a big opinion on that i'll get to it in a second um utility i think it'll go to hans roberto but there are some other guys that i'm a big kelvin gutierrez fan he's a third baseman for, that the royals have he showed a lot of power in this the winter ball season down in the dominican some other guys, uh, Eric Mejia, he has a chance. He is a switch hitting guy who can play outfield and the middle infield. He's a speed guy. He's get, gotten some chance at Kansas City. He could have some chance at being a utility. And then uh, Jason Guzman, he has yet to make his major league debut, but um, the Royals are a big fan of him. Uh, his contract ended, but they brought him back on a minor league deal. So the Royals like what they see from him, and they're going to give him a chance. And then Bobby Witt Jr., the 20, 21-year-old kid that the Royals drafted, um, is the face of the like the future of the Kansas City Royals. Currently, he is not on the 40-man roster, which is a big deal. The 40-man roster is really crowded this year. So he it's tough because the, he will most likely start in double a but the double a season does not start until may may 4th i believe a little later yeah it starts later um and i don't think the, the royals are not gonna put him on the opening day roster no matter what he does in spring training in my opinion they're gonna make him go to the minors because he has not played above rookie ball Last year, he got his his minor league season taken away from him, and so he was in the bubble. And from what the Royals say, he absolutely balled out. But he needs more reps. He's still a super young kid. You cannot put him in the majors, and if he fails, you can't let him get into his head like that. You've got to work his way up. And I believe he starts in double A. And I'd say he gets around, I don't know, 50 to 60 games there. And by that time, it's around September. And if it was if it was a few years ago, and they still had real September call ups where they expanded the roster to forty guys, he'd one hundred percent be in Kansas City. But it's only twenty eight guys now. So I don't know if Bobby. Unfortunately, I don't know if Bobby Witt actually plays for the Royals this season unless he goes down to Double A and absolutely tears it up, and he proves to the Royals that he belongs in Kansas City and makes them put him in Kansas City. I think the Royals save him for a year, save him save uh an arbitration year and and another control year and we'll see Bobby Witt in 2021. Actually, that you changed my mind on that. I'm not going to lie. Like I at first I was wanting him to come come to Kansas City and play at least be a backup utility guy, give some guy some rest, but no, he's a guy like he's too valuable. You want you need him to play every day. His potential is and insane. Could be his best ceiling, in his ceiling is absolutely astronomically high. It is the guy has crazy power, gold he, glove. He can steal bases, and everybody talks about his character. He yeah. is the baseball player that you dream of. That if you could build a guy in a lab, it would be Bill, Bobby Witt Jr. And his arms insane. Didn't he? He, used, he couldn't he have used, been a pitcher as well. He could have, but uh, he decided that his bat and glove was too good and he wanted to play shortstop and the I Royals, like that decision <laughs> yep um and so I think the Royals to protect him he's gonna play in the minors and unless he's batting like 400 he's not gonna play in the majors um just because of how crowded they are this year if it was different there was less guys in the there weren't as great players in the 40 man I think he'd be up there 
Um, and then the outfield, we got Whit Merrifield. And if you are a baseball fan and you don't know who Whit Merrifield is, you do not know baseball. Okay? We're not a baseball fan. <laughs> yeah. Whit Merrifield is going to play right field for the Royals this year. I know he loves to play the infield more. Um, but his versatility, I feel like, is going to be huge for the Royals this year. Uh, he's one of the best leadoff batters in baseball. He's guaranteed to hit around 300. And he's shown some, some pop here and there. Um, an absolute, just a ball player. Like, you love a guy like Great him. Great character as well. Like yep. You never seem to be frustrated on the baseball field, even when he need, could be yep. frustrated. You know, when he's in his big slump of, you know, like over 10, <laughs> which is like nothing for yeah. him. Um, you know, he's always got his head up and got a smile on. And then in center field, we got Michael A. Taylor. And I'm excited about his glove. We'll see what he does offensively. I hope it's not like a Billy Hamilton kind of signing where yeah. he's a glove guy. He's got speed, but he absolutely sucks hitting. Yeah, you can't use the speed if you don't get on base. I, I think Taylor, all he has to do is hit around 220. He'll be he'll probably be the nine-hole hitter. I just need that guy to get on base a couple times and let that let the lineup – do its thing and then in left field you know alex gordon retired and there was a big question mark of who was going to take over well the answer the royals answered that question by trading for andrew benintendi and we already talked about that trade benintendi i've always been a fan of him and i'm ecstatic for him to be wearing a royals uniform me too um and then there's some competition in the out in the fourth outfield spot you know a backup guy (sighs) bubba starling the (laughs) The first former first round pick who has is one of the biggest busts in baseball. I've always been a huge Bubba fan, but I've kind of given up hope on him. And I hope I hate to say it, but I hope the Royals do too because there are other guys who I feel like are more deserving. Um, a lot of a lot of people are picking Nick Heath to be that backup spot, and I, really I like him. I love Nick Heath. I love his energy. He's he's a huge energy guy. He's he's a lot of a Gerard Dyson type kind of guy. Yeah. Uh, a lower round draft pick, but electric speed. Crazy speed. If you guys haven't seen his speed, look it up, watch it. He stole over 50 bags in 2019 in the minor league season. Um he's got a great glove. His bat is is okay. Um but I I like Nick Heath a lot, but in my opinion, Edward Olivares is better. Um, Olivares is who they traded for last year. They traded Tim Hill for him. Um, Olivares, he played with the Royals last year, and he started off really hot. He's got the knock on him is he doesn't have the best glove, which if you know the Royals, you know it's defense first for them. Um, but I know he's worked on that this offseason, but he's got a great bat. Like, it's – him and Nick Heath kind of weigh each other out. Nick Heath's got the speed and the glove. Olivares has the bat and a okay glove. Personally, I think Olivares is the better option because of his bat. But, you know, I'm not the one making decisions. <laughs> um, and the DH, obviously, is Jorge Soler. Yeah. I think Jorge Soler, you know, he had a – injury-ridden season in 2020 he it, his oblique really hurt him and I remember when he heard it uh I could, in the game you could just see his swing was so off you know he was in pain he was grimacing and he he went on the IL and he just wasn't wasn't the same but I feel like Jorge Soler this year gets back to his 2019 season of 40 plus home runs he could be I think he's got another shot of winning a silver slugger in the American League and the Royals lineup the past couple seasons, you know, one through four has been good, but they've been good. That's it. And then the rest of the, the five through nine guys, it was such a drop off. You know, it was pretty easy to get outs against them. But I feel like the roster that they built this year is outstanding, um, you know, relatively speaking to where they have been. I agree. You got Whit Merrifield leading off, and then Mondesi, if he can put together the season that we're, that we're all hoping and expecting, the MVP season that we, every Kansas City fan has been waiting for, I that guy could be one of the best players in baseball. I think you have – if he can be 
the Mondesi, he bats second, and that is a huge boost to the team. That he, the difference between Mondesi batting second and hitting above three hundred and and getting on base, stealing bags, hitting home runs, or the Mondesi who bats seventh and is batting two ten and can barely get on base and has no power, like that is the difference between the Royals. That's like a, a ten game swing, at least, yes, in my opinion. I agree. And just a huge confidence team for the team. So you got Whit Merrifield and Mondesi, and then three, the third hold hitter, I think uh, probably uh, Hunter Dozier. And then four, you got Carlos Santana or Jorge Soler. You flip either of those two, and then you got Jorge, and then you got Salvador Perez. And then from there, you got Nicky Lopez and Michael A. Taylor. And oh, and Ben Attendee. So Ben Attendee will probably hit around six, in my opinion. Yeah. So really, all you're asking as a Royals fan and coach is for Nicky Lopez and Michael A. Taylor to just be productive. You don't have to be the guy batting. You just got to get on base. And whether that means you bunt, you walk, you get a little a little flare of a single you just need those guys to get on base because that one through six for the royals is lights out you got i mean merrifield he's guaranteed to get on base move runners mondesi has the power to hit 20 plus home runs and when he gets on base he's going to steal bags and then from there you have hunter dozier who i think will hit over 20 home runs carlos santana who can hit 30 and soler who is can hit 30 and even 40 and then Salvador Perez, who can hit 20. Right there, that is a ton of home runs. And you just need the other five guys to just get on base and, you know, be productive. Yeah. What about your predictions for the five-man five man rotation? Uh, Brad Keller, I think, is the Royals' ace. I absolutely love Brad Keller. That guy's a horse. He can Rule eat up innings. Rule five draft that never happens to be yep. how good Rule five guys never work out like that. And it's a huge success story for him and the Royals. And... Last year, he was one of the best pitchers in baseball, and he was never really talked about just because he wears a Royals uniform. Yeah, and how many – do you remember how many starts it was that he didn't even give up a run? Um, if I remember correctly, it was three starts, and it was over 20 innings straight That's to begin insane. the season that he did not give up a single earned run. That is crazy. And then from there, to begin the season, I think Danny Duffy starts in the rotation. I think he will get moved to the bullpen as the younger guys come up. Mike Miner. Oh, we forgot to talk about Mike Miner. He's a, a free agent signing. Mike Miner came to the Royals a few years ago. He rebuilt his career after having uh, surgery, and he really put his name on the map again. And from there, he went on to pitch for the A's and the Braves and was one of the better pitchers in baseball in 2019, and he's back with the Royals. Hopefully and, he can have that 2019 season with the yep. Royals. And then we've got Brady Singer and Chris Bubich, both guys who made their rookie debut last year. And Brady Singer had that one game where he, what was it? Uh, it was a no hitter through eight oh, yeah. innings. No, I, yeah, it was either eight or nine. I remember that. He he took it into the ninth inning. I mean, it was through yeah. eight innings. Yeah, you know Singer was the Royals' first round pick in 2018. A guy that Royals fans absolutely love, have been excited about, and Chris Bubich was another guy that they, one of those other college arms they drafted in 2018 out of Stanford. Left-handed guy, and his fastball sits around 92, 90. Not but fast. When he, he sounds fast, not faster majors. Well, but when he wants to, he can rev back, and he's touched 97, 99. Like, and his changeup is absolutely disgusting. Yeah. Um, so I think those guys are going to have some, a pretty good year this year. And then other guys that have a chance to make the, the rotation are Carlos Hernandez, which is another top Royals prospect. He's a very young guy. Um, like Chris Bubich, he hadn't pitched above a ball and he made his rookie debut last year and pitched very well. And then guys who I'm not sure they will start on the Royal, they will not be in the starting rotation. They could be in the bullpen, but Daniel Lynch and Jackson Coar, two guys, uh, I like Coar a lot. I like Coar a lot, but from what I'm hearing from spring training is Daniel Lynch is very close to being major league ready if not ready that's exciting i think daniel lynch could start in the bullpen and jackson coar 
might. I'm not really sure. I think one of those two guys could make the roster just because of how many guys they have. Um, but I don't know mentally if they're ready to start in the rotation. I think they're going to have to force Danny Duffy to the move to the bullpen because I personally think Danny Duffy is way better out of the pen. I, yeah. Yeah. And you move Daniel Lynch. You, Daniel Lynch, I think, is his replacement. And, and then you move Duffy to the pen. And then relievers, you got Josh Dahm out, the hardest throwing pitcher in baseball. Electric stuff. His yep. curveball is nasty. Shoulder to ankle drop. It's yeah. Scott Barlow, who I've always loved Scott Barlow. Um, huge guy, uh, huge slider guy, a big off speed guy, and his fastball even sits around ninety five, ninety six, but that's his secondary pitch. He his primary pitch is a slider. He's the type of guy to come in to get a save if you need to. As yep. Well. And then you got Jacob Junis, who is going to move from the starting rotation in the pen and has one of, if not the best slider in the game. Uh, Greg Holland, I think, probably will start the season as the closer. Jesse Hahn, who has had a big um, – he's had a lot of injury in his career, but he pitched extremely well for the Royals last year. Uh, one of the most dominant bullpen guys last year. He'll be, I think, probably the eighth inning guy. And then Kyle Zimmer. Kyle Zimmer was a first-round pick for the Royals, and he was always ranked one of the top prospects in baseball, but every single year he was faced with a season-ending injury, and he finally got his chance in 2019. Didn't go the way he planned. Uh, it wasn't spectacular and 20 2020 was a huge year for him and he balled out you know he came to play and his era was very good he was striking out batters a big problem with him in 2019 was his control he really answered that question in 2020 and then i think wade davis probably makes the bullpen um just because of who he is what he means to the royals and the, how he can mentor the rest of the guys and then that last bullpen spot, it's kind of up in the air. Um, a lot of people are saying Tyler Zuber, who has a very good curveball and has a upper 90s fastball. Another guy could be Scott Blewett. I'm not super high on Scott Blewett, but I do like him. Richard Lovelady, he's a left-handed pitcher, um, kind of like a three-quarter arm slot. I'm a big Richard Lovelady fan. I think it could be him or Jake Newberry. Jake Newberry has a lot of experience with the Royals. I think he probably just from the experience beats out the other guys because the other guys are all young. Um, they all the between Zuber, Love Lady, and Blewett, they all made their major league debut last year. So personally, I think it goes to Newberry. And then the final guy is Asa Lacy, um, Royals first round draft pick last year, and he has electric stuff. He's a left handed pitcher. I think he honestly has a better chance of making it to the majors this year than Bobby Wood Jr. Um, he hasn't <laughs> pitched in a single professional game yet because last year there was no minor league season, but he was in the bubble last year. Um, I think Daniel Lynch, Jackson Coar, and Asa Lacey, all three have a chance to make the Royals this year, make an appearance, if not stick with the Royals. And then some other guys um, that were also 2018 draft round picks – are Austin Cox and what's the other guy? Austin Cox and oh, Jonathan Bolin. Both of those guys were first and second round picks in 2018. They're kind of like so there's there's Brady Singer, Chris Bubich, and Daniel Lynch and Jackson Coar. Those are like the the tier one guys from that draft class, the tier two guys who are still very good pitchers, are Jonathan Bolin and Austin Cox. Uh, both guys are huge strikeout pitchers. I think, personally, the Royals moved them to the bullpen. I don't know if you see them. You might see them this year. I think 2022 is more of their year. I think those guys will be in the pen. Yeah, I'm excited for 2022 just because I feel like that's whenever all of those young guys are going to get their chance. And yep. I'm excited to see how they do. The future is very bright in Kansas City. Um what do you think of how many wins the Royals get this year? Personally, I think a lot of people are picking around like 71 to 75. I'm more of the 75 
to 80 range more realistically yeah, I, was, I think right around 78 that's, is, that's literally my prediction is 78 yeah i think anything higher you know the royals have had 100 lost seasons the past several seasons but i think anything better than 80 wins this season is absolutely outstanding for for the royals from where they have been and um where they should be and who knows Dayton Moore could think that they're ready and if they play well enough you know maybe they make some trades and they add some more guys and they make a run for a wild card spot I would ask <laughs> I'd love to see that but I doubt that happens this year <laughs> I, I think I think the Royals surprise people this year I think me too but I don't think they're I don't think they're a wild card team yet yeah I think next I think that this is a huge year for the Royals because they've been one of the worst teams in baseball, and now they're making moves that say they are ready to win, that they believe they can win now. And if they if they trip up and they don't perform this year, it uh, that's really damaging to the organization, in my opinion. Because this 2021 has been the year that we've been waiting for with waiting for all these young pitchers to and got waiting for these young pitchers. Um, waiting for the older guys to really put it together, waiting for Mondesi to have that MVP season. I think this is the year for the Royals to really make that step to to a winning organization again. Yeah. Um, I think this is a huge year, and guys get experience this year, and it's a, re- a big setup year for 2022 and, and on. Um, but I am so excited about this Royal season. And I hope the rest of you are. And thanks for listening to the Eagle Rewind. See you guys next time. See you guys.